quality never goes out of style. Our dear Minister of Education wants higher quality in education. What is quality and how can it be raised? One possible method is to proclaim ourselves the stellar center of educational excellence, or we can read Persig's brilliant metaphysical novel about quality, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Both solutions are unassailable, but will the quality be better? According to Norwegian standard, NSN ISO 9000, quality is defined as the degree to which one collection of inherent characteristics usually meets the needs or expectations stated, usually implied or mandatory. This definition leads to the question of whose needs or expectations to be met. The students, the teachers, the educational institutions, society or the minister of education. Is quality at all an objectively measurable quantity? Is a five-star hotel with hairdryer, pay TV, or pool and wireless internet better than a cozy little screenless pension? In an attempt to gain control of the quality of higher education, one has embarked on the Bologna process and PISA tests. Learning outcome descriptions are written in that way to try to make it all measurable. The curriculum indicates the target for learning, and then this is just to use a simple so-called PI to control loop on the students to achieve the desired results. Case closed. Well, there are some challenges with this approach. Have the student maturity and interests have been taken into account in the curriculum? Is regulation the best way to achieve results? Control loops are often used when the underlying physical process is not fully understood. Lack of knowledge is repaired with negative feedback. What does one know about learning? Is there a good model that could help us increase the quality in higher education? Educators talk about views on learning. These are often ideological anchored. It is currently social constructivism, with its hypothesis that it almost is impossible to teach someone something new, and if it is to happen, then it must be an interaction with others, who rules. Is it correct? Is it scientifically verifiable? No, let's rather introduce a whole new physical model for learning and quality in higher education. For the last hundred years, educators have tried to explain learning with the humanities and social science conceptual apparatuses. Success. Well, maybe it's on time to turn the tables, make a so-called Copernican turn, and rather explain pedagogy based on a scientific worldview. What you now want to hear represents a before and after moment in the history of pedagogy. Thomas Kuhn would cry with joy over this paradigm shift in learning theory. We simple realists. Love simple and beautiful models. Let's proceed to the work equipped with Occam's razor. The learning student can be described as a spring with the weight of life at the end. For some students, this model will last an oversimplification, but it is better with one verifiable model than just opinion. The spring represents the student's flexibility, while the weight represents inertia. With Newton's and Hooke's laws in the toolbox, one quickly arrives at the following differential equation where Z is the learning amplitude, K is the spring constant and M is the mass of the weight. The general solution to this equation is given here. A and B are constants that are determined by the student's prerequisites, boundary conditions. A closer study of this equation shows that the student left to himself oscillates learning wise in harmony with his own fundamental frequency F. If the student is to learn more, he must interact with the outside world, be it teachers, textbooks, internships or fellow students. The student must get a little push in the right direction and in step with its fundamental frequency, or subharmonic of it, so that already incorporated knowledge is maintained at the same time as new learning is achieved. If we also use a harmonic oscillator, spring and weight, as a model for external influences, the student can be put into forced oscillations, learning, based on the following formula. Here B is the friction in the learning process, F is the force, learning pressure, and omega F is the pressure frequency. In this round, we will skip the calculations that are needed to find the solution to this differential equation. The solution for this learning process is given by due to phi, the learning outcome Z as a function of time will generally not be in phase with the learning pressure F multiplied with the cosine of omega F multiplied by time. If you want optimal learning, the learning pressure must be on wavelength, resonance, with the student's natural frequency. Since there is a bit of friction B in the learning process, maximum learning outcomes will be achieved if the frequency of the learning pressure is slightly lower than the student's natural frequency. 
This learning harmony model, in step with the student's maturation and development, is to my surprise completely in line with Steinel Calls' pedagogical principles, even though they are based on an esoteric system of ideas that only the initiates understand. The spring model can fortunately be understood by everyone. As if that's not enough, a model has a measurable for quality. It is the so-called Q factor. The learning process described in the equation thus has a Q factor which says something about how easy it is to get the learning process going, and for how long the knowledge stays above a given level. The learning remains, after the learning is over. The higher the Q factor, the better the quality of learning and higher education. That the students themselves are responsible for their own learning, one sees from the fact that the students' specific M and K are above the fraction line. The more flexible one is, K, the faster the learning becomes, and with a portion of inertia, M, the effects become larger. The latter may seem paradoxical. Admittedly, big M makes it harder to get started, but once one is in the flow zone, it is like a childhood game, and with a large flywheel you can handle the steepest bends and major challenges. The more friction be there is in learning, the poorer the quality. It's great that the students thinks for themselves and is critical, but if good learning is to be achieved, the teacher and student must at least be on the same planet. But learning must go both ways. It is claimed that the best learning one can get is to teach yourself. I agree. Is there a model for this type interaction? Of course. Paired harmonic oscillators. But this has nothing to do with reality, you can object. But what is reality? Philosophers have been wondering about this since the dawn of time. David Hume 1711 1776 shocked his contemporaries by claiming that everything that existed in one's consciousness was based on sensory impressions and by attributing the connection between cause and effect to habits. It took Immanuel Kant, 1724-1804, a thousand illegible pages, critique of the common sense, to claim that the categories of time and space were inherent in us and could be used for to get order on sensory impressions and causal relationships. Imagine that you were born without senses. What would you be able to learn? Not much. All learning requires senses and the ability to speak and think. So how are the senses built up? Take eyes for example. They are an extension of the brain that has the ability to sense electromagnetic waves at given frequencies. Using four types of sensors, rods and taps, on the retina, the waves are converted into electrical impulses that are sent to the brain. These sensors are harmonic electric oscillators. What about the ears? Mechanical oscillators that convert sound pressure into electrical impulses that are sent to the brain. This is how one can continue. In principle, all senses are built as oscillators. Also, our speech is controlled by resonances created in the trachea. What about the brain then, the very crank of the learning system? It's a giant network of interconnected electric oscillators. The oscillations that appear by learning can be measured as gamma waves around 40 hertz. In this picture we see measurements performed on a child when learning the multiplication table. The brain researchers of our time, the not-so-harmonious Nobel Prize-winning Moser family, have given Kant a stroke of grace. Using rats they have found that the brain builds a sense of space and time based on acquired sensory impressions and brain oscillations. When everything that has to do with learning, senses, communication, thinking, boils down to oscillations, it is probably high time that the understanding of the learning process is also based on an oscillatory model. We have done this and thus brought quality in pedagogy and higher education a step further. And fortunately, we are not alone. It's going hectic activity in the field of educational neuroscience the pedagogy has an exciting future, and maybe one day we will be able to learn by stimulating the brain direct. Then all schooling will be superfluous, and I will become redundant. Lovely. Anyway, it went worse for the novel character in Persig Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance. He was so hung up on philosophical considerations about quality that the brain eventually went hot, and he had to get an electric reset.